I think our lab mic is working. We'll jump up here. All right. Appreciate you guys being here this afternoon. Um, we've had uh, had some good speakers and a lot of really interesting information. Um, I, uh, I hope I can kind of keep the ball rolling. Um, you know, uh, it's uh, kind of leave some big shoes to fill. We've got some, some very educated uh, guys in the room bringing some information today. So uh, what I want to do is, uh, is kind of take you through some things that we're doing at Master's Choice. Uh, take a look at, uh, at, at some things that, that we are offering and just some ways that it's, uh, as, an, as an industry that uh, growers may be able to, uh, to mitigate some of the risk. Uh, and manage some of some of the things that are going on as uh, you know as we focus on uh, on managing farms through uh, through times of adversity. Um, and uh, as as David said, I'm uh, the CEO at Master's Choice, um, and the the other role that I fill there is uh, director of research and development. Uh, so uh, I get the opportunity there to uh, kind of to work in in all aspects of research and development, everything from the uh, the genetic side and the agronomic aspect of things uh, over into livestock nutrition. Uh, so I lead a team that that uh, works very hard in, in both sides of that, that R&D to kind of bring together the, the best products for, for end use. And, and that is our focus is developing corn products for their end use. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are right now solely focused on livestock nutrition and most of that is going into dairy corn silage. So we'll, uh, we'll jump through this and, uh, and uh, see what we can, we can get through today. So one of the things as we started putting together, uh, putting together some things for uh, kind of managing through adversity, uh, we're seeing kind of unique time uh, in the industry where, uh, you know, and, and with us as, a, uh, as a, at a company that's working all over the, the nation, you know, we, we see different things in different markets, but uh, we're, we've been working in, in a couple of different uh, markets, uh, significant markets where, um, milk uh, the milk markets are really saturated and so we're starting to see growers emphasis shifting a little bit um, where everything has been centered around uh, pushing for more more production more production uh, what we're seeing now is that we're starting to look at ways to make ourselves more efficient um, how can we we be more efficient um, on our acres um, and also looking at driving components um, at, as a as a key part of that uh, so if, if, we can, uh, if we can drive our, our components, uh, a lot of times that, that is an area where, where a lot of our farms are, are finding uh, more profitability as opposed to, uh, to trying to just drive, uh, just drive our milk outputs. So looking at, looking at the things that affect our, our components and our, our milk production. Um, you know, there are going to be factors that, of this that we can affect through management, through decisions that we're going to make, and then there are going to be a lot of factors that, are, that basically fall out of our control. So when we look at, at some of the, the non-feed factors, so when we look at stages of lactation, uh, basically we're going to see, uh, as you know, a, a, we're going to see a peak uh, shortly after freshening when we see our, our colostrum come in. Um, our actually lowest point in there is at 25 to 50 days after calving. Uh, and then our actual uh, real peak in milk production, sure fine. Our actual peak in milk production really is coming in at about that 250 day mark. Um, the the other one of the other key factors that we see here is uh, seasons. So we've been talking about climate change, extreme heat. So extreme heat uh, drives components down. So that that is a uh, one of those factors that kind of falls out of our control. That's a, a negative factor. Um, herd health uh, is one of those one of those key factors, and then of course uh, looking at genetics. Uh, genetics plays a plays a, a huge role in not only overall milk production but in driving components as well. Um, and then when you also start to look at differences in in different breeds, so you know we see obviously that that some breeds have the potential um, to to uh, drive components uh, more than others. So looking at, uh, looking at components, looking at milk proteins, uh, proteins, sugars, uh, and starches are converted into our, our microbial proteins. Um, 
Microbial proteins are the primary source of essential amino acids used by the mammary glands uh, to make milk proteins. So looking at, at those, uh, those microbial proteins, those, those things that we, uh, uh, that we can kind of kick off in the rumen, that is what's really going to gonna drive the, the uh, production within the, uh, within the mammary glands. Looking also at milk fats, uh, you know, one of the key things to make sure is that you make sure that you have enough effective fiber in the ration. Um, so when we talk about master's choice corn, you hear us deliver a message uh, over and over again, we talk about floury grain. Um, and that floury grain is, is delivering the energy to the ration. It's important that we make sure that we have enough effective fiber uh, in that ration. Um, you know, and, and you guys can deliver that fiber from a number, number of different sources. Can be coming from your corn silage, can be coming from some of your other forages. Uh, but, uh, but really that, that fiber is going to play a, a key role in, in uh, driving milk fat. Um, acetate and butyrate production uh, is utilized by the mammary glands uh, in milk fat production. Excuse me. The other thing in, uh, you know, we can, we can see our, uh, our milk fats coming in from body fat immobilization, which is obviously not where we want to see that, that milk fat coming from. Uh, we, want to, we want to be driving that with our, our feedstuffs. All right, hopefully you can hear me a little better now. <clears throat> so this is a, uh, this is a quote um, that, that we pulled from Penn State Extension. Um, and and I'll, uh, I'll read that to you, but I want to, I want to kind of backtrack and, and there's some key things I want to point out in here. The relative amounts of protein and energy that are available in the rumen at a given time is a major factor affecting rumen fermentation and therefore milk components. Any diet or management factors that affect rumen fermentation can change milk fat and protein levels. Consistently providing adequate energy and protein and balanced amounts of rapidly fermentable carbohydrate and effective fiber are keys to maintaining optimum levels of milk, levels of milk components. The challenges in feeding for milk components is that high energy, low fiber diets that increase milk protein are likely to reduce fat levels. All right, so, so what we want to look at there, uh, the things that I really want to focus on here, um, providing adequate energy and protein and balanced amounts of rapidly fermentable carbohydrate and effective fiber uh, are keys to maintaining milk components. Uh, so we, I mentioned that before uh, that, you know, we gotta have, we gotta have digestible starch in there to, to uh, deliver the energy side of that. Uh, but keep in mind here uh, how important that fiber is. Um, you know, we talk about there, there in that, that last sentence, uh, the challenge in feeding, uh, feeding for milk components is that high energy, low fiber diets that increase milk, milk protein are likely to reduce fat levels. So that, that fiber is playing a, a key role in really driving the, uh, uh, the, the butter fat, the milk fat in that, uh, in that ration. So looking at, uh, looking at some of the things that Master's Choice is doing here briefly, um, I, wanna, I wanna take a look at some data from our 2017 plots. Uh, what we're looking at here, this, this is just a simple scatter plot and what, what we've got here, um, if you look, look on the chart, uh, now this, this is data from our, what we call our advancement plot program, which is uh, silage plot scattered all over the country. A uh, number of those that are in uh, fall within Pennsylvania, New York. Uh, if you look on the left side, you'll see the, uh, the competitor data uh, versus the master's choice data on the right. Uh, and, and what I want to key on here is just looking at, at overall trends. Uh, so when we, when we take all those silage samples in, what we're looking at here, this is the, uh, we're looking at uh, starch digestibility here. So when we see these boxes, so you see here on the left side, um, this, this box where you have this line right through the, the middle, that is basically the median um, or the average that we had for, for all competitors' starch digestibility. Uh, when we jump over here to the master's choice side, same thing, you see that, that line through the middle, that is, that is where our, our average falls. So when you look at all the samples from 2017 to master's choice, uh, the average, uh, our average basically matches up with the uh, the high average for your competitors. Um, so, so all of those, 
uh, all those checks that we had within those plots and, and those checks are made up of uh, all kinds of different uh, competitive products from, um, you know, basically what we do is, is we have the, uh, the cooperators and the producers uh, use whatever else they're using on their farm in those plots, uh, key hybrids in those areas, so, so really, really getting a good comparison of what's out there. Um, and so, you know, you see, you really see that, um, that emphasis that we've had in, in selecting genetics for, uh, for starch digestibility really come through. Um, and, and there again, you've heard us talk about starch digestibility for a long time. Um, and and that, is, that is a key component to uh, driving milk production, obviously. Uh, but the other thing uh, that I want to look at here is I want to look at fiber. So even though we don't spend a great deal of time talking about fiber, uh, that is a key selection tool for us. So right along with our, our starch re uh, research work, uh, we're making genetic selections um, and developments on fiber adjustability every year. So same thing here, looking at, uh, looking at averages from 2017, uh, where we, we see the, the average from the competitors uh, versus the average from the master's choice line, we see a significant difference here. Um, and like we said here, this is where we can really deliver some of that, uh, some of that increase in milk fat. Uh, is by, by delivering that, that, uh, that digestible fiber. Um, and, uh, you know, if I, can deliver, if I can deliver a significant portion of that from my, my silage, uh, that's going to make a, make a big difference in my ration. Um, but there again, you see, um, you know, and we see, we see probably an even, even, bigger, uh, even bigger difference here in fiber uh, versus competitors than we, than we do in the starch. Um, so, you know, both of those, both of those sides of uh, corn silage digestibility go into uh, developing the, the best possible corn silage hybrids. Uh, so really wanted to uh, want to stress that, that, you know, that we're doing uh, a lot of fiber research right along with our starch uh, for our lineup. So we'll talk about uh, some management things, looking at risk mitigation. Um, so what are, what are some things that we can do as producers um, that, uh, that give us a good opportunity for success um, as well as kind of taking away some of that risk um, and, and things that can go wrong throughout, throughout the year. Um, using multiple hybrids across your acres is, uh, is one of the key things that, uh, that works really well. Um, now the, uh, the, the King's Agri-Seeds team, um, they are, uh, you know, with all of the uh, dealers and distributors we work with around the country, uh, their network is as good as any at placing hybrids and you know that's that's something I know that they have stressed is using multiple hybrids across across your acres um, you know and, and we, we look through that stuff all fields are, are not created equal we see uh, we see as we look at a at an individual field we're going to see all different soil types across it we're going to see um, you know different environments as we move across a field um, the other thing to, to consider here is that not all genetics are created equal. Um, you know, so uh, my background in, in working in, uh, in, in the genetic side of the business for us, uh, I have the opportunity to see a wide, uh, a wide variety of genetics that are within our germplasm uh, and also get to look at a lot, of, uh, a lot of genetics that are out there in the industry. And, and there, is a, there is a wide range in, in genetics that are out there, and, uh, and these genetics all kind of have different performance characteristics. Um, so it's important that you're matching the right genetics to the right, uh, uh, the right location and the right end use. Um, using multiple fields kind of allows us to eliminate some of those weak areas. Um, and and what, what I mean by that, if we're, if we're making selections, um, I'm going to have, uh, you know, if I have a handful of corn hybrids that I want to consider using, I'm going to have some of those hybrids that are consistent workhorse hybrids that uh, I can put those on stress ground and I know that my, my bottom end for yield uh, is going to be really solid, that I can, I can uh, count on putting that thing on stress ground, I'm still going to get a good crop. Uh, then I may have another hybrid that has a much higher yield ceiling that, uh, that, will, that has the, the ability to out yield some of those workhorse hybrids but doesn't perform well in those droughty soils. So making those, making those genetic selections and putting those in the, in the right location uh, give me the best, uh, the best success. 
And, uh, you know, as we, as we look at some of these things, you know, you're going to see differences in flowering dates. You're going to see, um, you know, looking at, at differences in maturity uh, will help spread some of that risk. Um, the, uh, when, we look at, uh, when we look at producing a corn crop, um, you know, we, we have some key times in the growing season that are where a crop is really vulnerable. Uh, we're really vulnerable from the time we put that seed in the ground till we get, get that corn crop rowed up. Uh, and we, we basically get those rows shaded so that, that early seedling phase uh, is a really critical time that we want to make sure we eliminate as much stress as we can uh, because so much of our yield is being determined in that, that early phase. The other time that's really critical is during our pollination period. Um, and you know, um, when, when we look at, at where pollination occurs, it, it's a really short window. We just have a few days that that, that crop is, is getting all its pollination done. Um, and if, if we run into an extreme weather situation, um, uh, typically what we think of as extreme heat, um, extreme drought that kills the pollen, dries out silks, um, and prevents, uh, prevents good thorough pollination, uh, we wind up with a, with a corn crop with no, no corn kernels. So we have very low, low starch levels. Um, you know, and, and any time that I can vary up my genetics, vary up my maturities, I'm going to change those dates a little bit. Um, you know, so if I have, I have one that unfortunately pollinates at the worst possible time, if I've got another corn crop that, well, it pollinated, or another corn hybrid, if it pollinated a week earlier, um, I avoid that risk of having no starch across, you know, a, a large portion of my production. So just looking at, looking at multiple hybrids, multiple, multiple relative maturities give us, uh, you know, a lot better chance at avoiding some of those problems. Um, looking at, uh, at whole field uh, averages, so um, basically breaking up a field, placing the right hybrids in the, in the right place, I can apply a lot of those applications across my entire uh, farming operation. Um, you know, so we're just looking at it at, a, at another level. Um, there again, aids in pulling up the and pulling up the yield floor and pushing up the yield ceiling. So just uh, just like I was talking about, placing those hybrids uh, where those uh, those high yielding performers have an opportunity, uh, as well as putting those uh, those hybrids that have that higher ceiling uh, in a stress environment, putting those on that stress ground uh, eliminates some of that risk. So the, the biggest thing with this is making sure that, uh, that we have a plan. Um, you know, and, and this is, you know, it, there's, a, there's a lot of time over the winter, the spring, that goes into deciding how we're going to manage our acres for the upcoming year. Um, it's very important that you're looking at your genetics and how your genetics are going to go into that plan. Uh, so are we, are we getting our seed purchases made to get the right, the right corn hybrids and are we getting them then planned out for the right acres. Uh, so, you know, we don't want to be going into the into the field in you know springtime. It's time for planters to roll and making our decisions as the planter is rolling. Uh, we want to avoid that as much as we can. Uh, you know, we're obviously going to be making some decisions on the fly depending on what Mother Nature throws at us in the spring. Uh, but the earlier we can plant, make those plans, and get ahead of that, the better off we're going to be. <coughs> so. Having as much knowledge on, on each field uh, as possible is going to go a long way. Uh, your soil type, uh, moisture, um, end use, planting order, all those things are going to play a factor. Uh, I, want to, I want to key on there on, on end use. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that, that uh, at Master's Choice that we really specialize in is hybrids specifically for their end use. Now, um, you know, we're here today largely talking about corn silage, but all your acres may not be corn silage. You may have some acres that, uh, that you want to take to dry grain, that you want to take to the elevator, or you want to use them to, to be fed on the farm. Um, you should be making your hybrid selections specifically based on what you want to do with them at harvest time. Um, and as, a, as an industry, that is, uh, that's one of the places that the seed corn industry has, has fallen short in that uh, our industry has developed corn hybrids that are high yielding grain hybrids and um, they just get forced into every, every situation. Um, you know, when you, when you look at what a lot of the industry is doing, they're, they're simply just funneling grain genetics that, uh, that, are, that are working in the Midwest for grain farms. 
you know, well, if it, if it makes uh, 250 bushel corn in the Midwest, it, you know, surely it'll make a lot of big pile of corn silage too. Uh, so make sure that you're making selections based on what your end use is gonna be, whether it's silage, whether it's dry grain, uh, but, uh, you know, really understanding what your, what your plans are and having a plan in place goes a long ways. <clears throat> Working with companies that have a unique genetic base, so vary your genetic selections across your acres. Um, you can do that within, uh, within our lineup, you can look to other people's corn, corn hybrids, but don't put all your eggs in one basket. Make sure that you are mixing that up across your acres, um, you know, and, and work with your dealer to make sure that they are, they are placing a, a diverse group of hybrids on, on your farm. Uh, the more, you know, the more we can do that across acres. Um, you know, I, I work with a, with a lot of guys and, and I'll see guys that uh, they have a particular hybrid that, that does really well on their farm and they want to put all their acres to that. Um, and and there, is, there is merit for um, security in a hybrid that, uh, that you've had success with, um, but we never want to get overloaded on that uh, because it's a matter of time until we have the, the, raw, the year with the wrong conditions for my favorite hybrid where it comes up short um, and having, having some of those other genetics on the farm can go a long way in, in helping us to, to dodge some of that risk. Um, you know, and, and with, with the, the, my background in, in research and development, you know, I, I sat down and working on overall inventory management and we start looking at sales numbers and, and this is one of the places where, um, where it's really difficult for me because when a, when a corn hybrid comes into our lineup, um, by that time, I've seen it for a few years. I'm really comfortable, I'm really confident uh, when, it, when it comes into the lineup, but it's always a slow adaptation for the, for the end user, especially for our dairy guys. Uh, because not only does it have to perform agronomically, but it's got to feed well. So it's a, uh, it's a slow adaptation for, for new hybrids. Um, but I, you know, I say all that to, to tell you that when something comes in the lineup, uh, a new product, um, it is a proven product. Uh, we have, we've brought it through uh, very rigorous training, uh, uh, very rigorous uh, testing to get it uh, ready to go in the lineup. Um, and it, you know, those are products you can have confidence in. Um, you know, those, those old favorite hybrids, they were new hybrids at one time too. Uh, they're just hybrids that, that uh, have, have stuck around a long time. So make sure you're looking at new genetics all the time. Uh, don't, don't get overloaded on, on your old favorites. Um, one of the things that, uh, that we talk about is the third rule when selecting hybrids. Um, I, can, I can break my, my acres into thirds uh, a, whole lot, a whole lot of times I can do that um, and I can mix and match those hybrids across those acres uh, to avoid some